The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels according to He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, after a little detour this morning of taking care of stuff from last week, we are now here and ready to begin another season of Lent. We, of course, began this season this past Wednesday having those black, oily ashes spread on our foreheads in the shape of a cross. Hearing those words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It was that reminder of our sinfulness and our mortality on this earth. It was a reminder of the repentance to which we are called. As part of that worship service, we were invited into what we call this discipline of Lent, which we describe as self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, sacrificial giving and works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. So this name, Lent, comes from an old English word that refers to springtime or the lengthening of days. This Lenten season reflects that time of year where the days are finally getting a little bit longer after winter, where there's more and more light around us each day. And those things that have been dormant for so long are finally starting to think about springing back to life. It's a renewal of the world around us. Lent also, as we hear over and over, is that 40-day season which in one respect, uh, Scripture uses as a description to just say a really long time. But it's also a way to connect it to other events that have happened uh, throughout the lives of God's people. The 40 days that it rained at the time of the flood, the 40 days that Moses spent with God fasting and writing down the words of the covenant, the 40-day journey that Elijah took to Mount Horeb, Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And as we just heard in the gospel lesson, Jesus' 40 days of fasting in the wilderness before he begins his ministry. So really, this season for us is a reminder that we get to stand in that same promise and those same promises of God that all of God's people from all periods of time have got to stand in as well. And for me, it, sound, it feels like Lent can be summed up by a, this one line of Scripture that comes from the book of Joel and one, one line that we heard this past Wednesday where it says, Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That might sound familiar. We sometimes sing that as a gospel acclamation, but return to the Lord your God. 
And I always have to ask, return from where? Where have we gone? Well, let me start then with a question. Having just heard about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by the devil, have you ever had a time where you've felt tempted? Has there ever been a moment or moments where you felt the devil or felt evil powers at work in the world around you or in your life? I mean, if so, think about those times or think about one of those times. What were those powers trying to get you to do? Or what did being tempted mean for you? Because in today's gospel story, we heard about temptation. We heard about how Jesus was tempted in three different ways. The first was about his hunger. You know, he was in the wilderness for 40 days, fasting and praying, and it said at the end of the, all of that, he was famished. Well, yeah, I mean, after just a day or two, I would be famished, so more power to him for the whole 40. But what did the devil offer to Jesus? He said, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. I mean, if you are who you say you are, and you can do those miracles as though you say you can... Just make some bread out of nothing or out of this stone and give yourself something to eat. There's no need to be this hungry. That devil always creeps in in our moments of hunger and weakness, right? But Jesus' reply to that, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. So the devil came back with a second temptation, preying on our desire for power the devil showed to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and promised that Jesus could have all of their glory and authority and have all power over them if what? If Jesus would worship the devil. I mean, did he do that? Of course not. His reply this time, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The third temptation then preyed on his desire for safety and protection. The devil took him up to the highest part of the temple and told him to throw himself off of there. Now, if I had someone tell me to jump off the highest place possible to see what would happen, I'm not confronted with that too often. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm probably going to say that I'm not really tempted by that at all because I have no real desire to jump off anything to see what's going to happen. But here the devil just begins to mess with Jesus. If Jesus claims to trust God so much, why won't Jesus just prove it to the devil? That God is on his side and it would never put him in danger. But Jesus doesn't give in there either. He says, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, there's a couple interesting things about this situation, and the one is that it seems as though Jesus never gives his own answer. He responds every time to this devil with quoting what? Scripture. Specifically the Torah in Deuteronomy when Moses is sharing God's covenant with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Remember those Israelites, the ones whom... God delivered from slavery into freedom and who went from wandering in the wilderness to living in the promised land, being shown this power that God has for them. I mean, these teachings that Jesus is quoting were given by God to Moses to give to the Israelites as a way of living in that promise. And so they still rang true for Jesus in the wilderness. And really, they should ring true for us today. The other thing that I found interesting about this situation is is how we interpret or think about temptation. I mean, when you think about it or when you think about the ways you've been drawn by temptation or the ways you've seen evil working in your life, do you think about the ways that this evil or these temptations draw us toward something? I mean, they draw us to greed or gluttony or the things we're told that we need. They draw us to power and glory and privilege and the way we can put ourselves above others. 
These things draw us to and towards safety and security and, and this individualism that takes us away from community and away from the body of Christ. But as we hear this story of Jesus in the wilderness, what if we reframed the way we think about evil and temptation? And instead of thinking about what we're drawn away from or drawn, what we're drawn toward, let's think about what we're drawn away from. So these tempting yet empty promises that the devil was making to Jesus were meant to draw Jesus away from God. I mean, the story happens right after his baptism where, where God exclaims from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. And so with that claim of his identity still ringing in Jesus' ears, he is led from the Jordan River right into his wilderness experience. And as he was there, this devil, this, this evil force, was trying to draw Jesus away from this life and identity with God. This life of freedom and love and wholeness. So when we think about our own temptations and the way that evil tries to direct our lives, can we think about or see how those forces are, drawing, are trying to draw us away from freedom and love and wholeness? Can we see how we're being drawn away from a life with God? I mean, I can tell you that I don't know what exactly evil and the devil look like in the world today, other than saying that its purpose is, I think, to draw us away from God. I mean, I can tell you some ways that I think I see it embodied around me, I mean, some of those things are blatantly evil things that happen, and yet some are masked with good intentions and good desires. I mean, because remember, when, when we saw the devil at work with Jesus in the wilderness, he too was quoting Scripture. Yes, even Scripture can be used to draw us away from God's presence. So then what do we do when we, we are faced with temptation and evil? I think we go back to those words from Joel. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is what we are returning to. We are returning from leaving God, from being drawn away from God. We are called to return to God. So when we're faced with this decision or temptation to go in a different direction, and we don't know where to go, we should ask, does this lead me from God or to God? Is this way about my selfish desires or does it lead me back to the body of Christ? Is this way about loving myself and those close to me or, or is it about loving God and all of my neighbors? Or when we find ourselves in the midst of our own wilderness experiences, being surrounded by evil or feeling utterly alone, whether it's for 40 minutes or 40 days or 40 years, I mean, we're called to remember Jesus' wilderness experience, where in, the, in that whole time he was there, he was still accompanied by the Holy Spirit, and he was still claimed as God's beloved child. And when we think of that in our experiences, we should know that we are never alone either. And when we lose our way, whether it's in these 40 days or in any day of our life, may we always hear those words from Joel and turn back and return to God. Because it's in God and no other empty promise where we are promised freedom and love and wholeness. Amen.